Did you know that a stack is just like a stack of plates? And did you know that a hash map is just a glorified dictionary? Data structures doesn't have to be hard to learn. You honestly just have to learn it the right way. I'm gonna teach you guys how to be DS pros. Well, maybe not pros, but you'll at least know what an array is by the end of this video. All right, so I know you hear the term data structures all the time, but what the hell is a data structure? Data structures are a way to just organize and store data. The biggest problem people have when learning about data structures is that they try to memorize things versus actually learning the concept behind what a data structure does. So what better way to learn than with common household items. One simple data structure that we can use is an array. And an array is just a fixed container with multiple tiny containers inside of it. You can't really change the size of this data structure, but that's okay, we'll learn why next. You can actually store a bunch of different data types inside of this. I'm talking integers, booleans, strings, longs, floats, you name it. So each smaller container is labeled with indexes. So if we start at the very left and work our way to the right, we'll start with the zero with index and then go Go all the way to the length of the array. Yeah, we always start with zeros in computer science. Honestly, don't ask me why, but that's just the rule. So how do we actually go through all the elements in an array? So you guys have heard of for loops before, right? We can use a for loop to iterate through every small container in the array until we find what we're looking for. This is called a linear search. So let's go take a look at an example. Okay, so now we're gonna take a look at how to create an array in this example. So you can see here, we actually have an array with groceries, apple, banana, carrots, olive oil, and avocado. So you can see that we've actually printed out the number of groceries, which is just the same thing as the length of the array. So you can see here, number of groceries equals five. And then we have a for loop that goes through each item in the grocery list and prints it out. So we have our grocery list printed out right there. And then what we're going to end up doing is we're going to actually find a grocery item at a specific index. So this is how you find a grocery item at index three. So we can see here the grocery item at index three is olive oil, which looks like it is true. Now, remember, we can't actually actually resize an array. So if we set a value equal to null, and then we print out the number of groceries, we'll still have five items, but instead we'll have apples, bananas, carrots, and then the third index will be null and then avocados. So it'll be the same exact size. We can actually replace some values with null. Array lists are pretty similar to arrays, but they don't have a fixed size. So if you remove an item, you're actually gonna decrease the size of this array list. And if you add an item, you're gonna increase the size. That's pretty much the biggest difference, honestly. So let's go look at a coding example here too. So here we've actually initialized an array list with strings as our values, and we've added the same grocery item. So apple, banana, carrots, olive oil, and avocados. And we're gonna go ahead and print the size of this list. So we can see that the size of the list is five. Then we're gonna print out every item in the grocery list just like we did with the array and we can see them listed here then we're going to go ahead and actually grab one of the grocery items at the third index and this is denoted using dot get so we can see here the grocery item at index three is olive oil and then we're going to go ahead and remove an element so we're going to remove the zeroth element which is the first element in the list and then we're going to actually print out the size and it looks like we've reduced the size because again array lists are resizable on like arrays. And then we're going to go ahead and print all of the items and you can see we're actually missing the apple in the beginning because we've removed that element but we have a banana, carrots, olive oil, and avocados. Okay so let's move on to linked lists. Linked lists are like arrays and array lists cousin. You know the one that shows up late and hung over to every family reunion? Okay buddy boy here it is. Well with linked lists you can really only go forwards or backwards. You can't really access elements in between like you can with an array or an array list. Each index points to the next index or node. So each node has a pointer to the next node. It's kind of like a paper chain. So if you break this chain, you actually lose all of the elements afterwards. And if you iterate through this chain and you don't keep track of where you started, you'll also lose all the elements behind you. Yeah, I know. Pretty unhelpful cousin, if you ask me. So let's look at a coding example of a linked list, shall we? So usually what happens in Java is they have a list node class or a linked list class. And right here, I've actually defined the player, which is the data type, um, it'll be a string, and then also our list node next. Because remember, list nodes are actually like a chain. One node connects to another node, which connects to another node. So you want to have a reference in memory to your other list node. I've gone ahead and initialized all of these list nodes. So we have our paper chain, right? So we have Michael Jordan, which points to L2, Ronaldo, which points to L3, 
Steph Curry, which points to L4, and Messi, which points to Null. So now I'm gonna go ahead and actually insert list node five, which is Garnett, into the list at the very end of the linked list. Um, so we actually have to create a temporary list node right here, and then we use a while loop right here, which will loop us through the entire linked list when we see that temp is not equal to null, but our temp.next, which in this case, if temp gets to Michael Jordan and our temp.next is equal to null, that means we know we're at the end of the list and we're gonna set our temp.next equal to our new node. Likewise, we can do the same exact thing while we're inserting at a specific index. In this case, we're gonna insert right after Michael Jordan. So we do the same thing where we check our temp and make sure that it's not equal to null. Um, if the temp player equals Michael Jordan, then we set our L5 next to temp.next because remember if we get all the way over here and our temp.next is null we want to set l5 equal to our temp.next and again we set temp.next equal to l5 so that's how we insert it and the output looks like this once we inserted garnet at the end you can see that garnet is at the end once we tried to insert garnet after michael jordan you can see that garnet is right after michael jordan right there Okay, so hash maps are my favorite data structure. The trick is to organize them in the right way. Let's say we have a list of countries and we're gonna organize those countries in an array. So let's say we wanna find Ghana. And well, if we wanna find Ghana, we're gonna have to iterate through every element in that list until we find it. But what if I told you there was a better way to do that? Well, there definitely is, and that's called using a hash map. Now, I like to think of a hash map like a dictionary. We can use my makeshift atlas book as a dictionary. But it's a, it's a real dictionary, as you can see. A hash map is just a key value paired data structure. Similar to a dictionary, you're not gonna search through every single page of the dictionary to find the word ventriculoc esternostomy. You're just gonna go straight to the Vs and then check there. And don't ask me how I know what ventriculoc esternostomy is. Is. Likewise, with hash maps, you can use that key to narrow down exactly what you're looking for. That way we can start looking in the G's right away rather than going through all of the elements. Okay, now let's look at a coding example. So this is how you denote a hash map. We have a key, which is gonna be a string, and our value is gonna be a list of strings. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna have countries that are associated with a specific letter. So what I've done here is I've initialized a bunch of lists. So I have a list G, which has Ghana, Greenland, and Greece as the countries inside of this list. I have a list I, which has India, Ireland, Iran, Iraq, and Italy. And then I also have a list U, which has the US, UK, and Uruguay. So now what we've done is we've actually added our key value pairs. Our key is the letter itself and our value is the list. And I've used the put keyword in order to put these values into our hash map. So we've put G with our G list, the letter I with our I list, and the letter U with our U list. So now what we can do is use countries.getI, which is using the key to get the value. Value, and our value will be that list of countries that start with an I. So then for each country, we're gonna print it out. As you can see, we have India, Ireland, Iran, Iraq, and Italy. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna actually remove a value. So we're gonna remove the I list altogether. And all you have to do is say remove and then add the key to remove the value. And then we're gonna print out actually what our results are after deleting. And after deleting, our result is null because we no longer have a value associated with that key in the hash map. Speaking of data structures and algorithms, Rhythms, you're going to want to use a structured platform to actually get concrete practice. Neatcode.io offers that platform for you. Neatcode has a wide array of practice problems, including the NC150, 150, 150 data structures and algorithmic questions that are super relevant to the interview process. They have questions such as finding the longest substring without repeating characters or searching for values in a 2D array. Not only that, but they've laid out an entire roadmap on these topics so that you can plan your time accordingly and track your progress. And if you have trouble working through the problems, they have comprehensive video solutions that walk you through each problem step by step, as well as the Leap Code quiz feature to help people quickly review Leap Code problems. And the best part, all of this is completely free. I've been using this platform for my own prep so that I can teach data structures and algorithms in our Discord sessions every Friday. Speaking of which, we discuss DSA and software engineering topics in the Discord every week. You won't want to miss out. And don't forget that Neatcode Pro includes really detailed courses on interview prep for data structures and algorithms. The first 20 people to use the code Pooja get a discount on upgrading to Neat Code Pro. Link is in the description below. All right, let's get back into it. All right, the next data structure is a stack. So as you can see, my little prop of plates was very helpful in the intro, but I'm gonna show you guys what a stack actually does. So let's say this is our empty stack right here. So first we take an element and we plop it on the bottom. So that's our first element. Then we take a second element, plop it. Third element, 
Okay, so this is our last element. So let's say we want to remove some items from the stack. Well, can we take the first item that we put down? Yeah, it's gonna be kind of hard to get that first item. So we're just gonna grab the top item. So this is a LIFO or a last in first out. The last item that we put in the stack is the first item we can pop off of the stack. So pretty simple, right? Let's look, take a look at a coding example. So this is how you denote a stack in Java. We just use the keyword stack and then we create our data type as well. So we're gonna store a bunch of strings in our stack and in this case we're going to just store some cars so in order to push things onto the stack all you do is stack.push and again we're pushing the bmw to the bottom of the list we're pushing the corvette as the next element on top of the bmw and the lambo at the very top and remember it's a first in last out or a last in first out structure so the way that we push all these values the first value that we can take out is the lambo so let's just check and run this we're checking what's on the top. It looks like our Lambo is on the top. If we do a pop, that means it removes the element on the top and returns. So we get a Lambo. And then we actually push another value, which is the Toyota Camry. And then we do another peak. And it looks like we had the Toyota Camry on top. So again, the last thing that you put in is the first thing that you get out with a stack. Queues are pretty dang cool too. They're kind of like the opposite of a stack. So if you've ever been waiting in line for something, you know that the first person that waits in line is the first person that gets served, whether that's at a restaurant or a coffee shop or whatever. It's FIFO, the first in, first out. So you can probably imagine what that looks like. And the interesting thing about denoting a queue is that it's an interface. So we're gonna use a linked list to actually extend this interface. And you can use other data structures as well. But again, a queue is a first in, first out data structure. So the first element you put in using q.add, we're adding an apple. That's the first element that's going to come out. So we've added an apple, a banana, and a cherry. And then we've gone ahead and actually printed out what's in the queue. And you can see that we have an apple, banana, and cherry. And then we go ahead and use q.remove to remove the first element in the list. And then we print out the removed element, which in this case is apple. And then we go ahead and print out the entire list after removal. So after removal, we have a banana and cherry. And then we're gonna add another element to the list, which is a date. And this actually adds it to the end of the list. So we're gonna be at the end of the queue now. And we are going to actually check what our next element is at the top of the list, which is our banana. That's our earliest value that we've put in. And then we actually peak our entire list. So here you could see our banana and our cherry and our date. So that's how we denote a queue. And that is how that works. So the last data structure, but not the least, is a tree. A tree is similar to a family ancestry tree. So if you think of a person, right? And that person has children and there are many children associated with that person. Then their children have children and their children have children and you can keep going on and on and on. So that's kind of what a tree does. You can have some value and that value will have children, etc. We can actually use this thing called recursion to traverse through the tree, looking at each child's child until we find the right value. In order to find Henry Huckleberry, we look for the children that have Huckleberry as a last name and continue down that path until we find the name that we're looking for. Of course, there are better uses of this, but this is the best example I could come up with, honestly. It's kind of like mini hash maps all linked together. Okay, so now we're gonna look at a tree, which is a little bit different than the other data structures that we've looked at. And specifically, we'll look at a binary search tree. So a binary search tree, instead of having several descendants, it'll have two children per node. So here you can see the class node right here. So we have a value for our node, but then we also have a right child and a left child. So you can see that they're denoted here. So we actually add elements recursively, which means we use a function that calls itself several times until we find the right answer. So here, for example, if we have a new node that we want to insert into a binary tree with a specific value, the way that we order these values in a binary tree is in order. So our left child will always be less than the certain value of our node, and then the right child will always be more than the certain value of our node. So here we want to actually insert by checking, okay, what is the left child of this node that we're currently at and what is the right child? If our value is less than our current node, then we wanna go to the left. If our value is greater than our current node, we wanna go to the right. And we wanna keep repeating that process over and over again until we find the right place to insert our node and there no longer is a value that is greater than or less than. So that's kind of how we use recursion here. 
We can also find an element the same way. So for example, we'll start at the first node and then if current is equal to null, we can actually return false because that means that's our base case. Otherwise, if our value is equal to our current value, then we return true because we found what we were looking for. Otherwise, again, we use recursion. This is the contains node recursive function and then we just call contains node recursive current left. If it's less than our current value, if it's greater than our current value, then we actually call again contains node recursive and then we put current dot right into our parameters. So we're actually checking to the right because we know our value is greater than the current value. There are definitely more data structures that we haven't covered, namely tree maps, tries, and cyclical graphs. But for now, it should give you a base understanding of what these data structures looks like and how to use them for your coding needs. So have fun.